Hi, it's Miles Stewart here, Olympian, world champion, world series winner. You're listening to the Physical Performance Show. And the winner is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Endure IQ's online long course triathlon courses and the Physical Performance Show's new learnings membership through Patreon. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. Of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, featured performers, expert editions, coaches corners, and interest editions. And as you heard at the top of the show, this week you're in for a real treat with featured performer Miles Stewart. Now, if you are a triathlon fan, Miles Stewart unlikely needs any introduction. As a junior triathlete through the 90s, Miles Stewart was one of the most prominent names in the sport throughout that period. Earlier this year in 2020, Miles was recognised with an Order of Australia Medal, OAM, for his service to triathlon and sports administration. A fitting honour for someone who has been around the sport for 35 years plus, as you'll hear Miles outline. But prior to Miles's administrative career, Miles's sporting resume was so impressive. Miles became the world champion at just 20 years of age in 1991. Prior to that, as you'll hear Miles outline, he had great success from the get-go, racing immediately as a professional athlete on commencing the sport as a junior. Miles was part of triathlon's debut in the Olympic Games as part of the Australian team, the Sydney Olympic 2000 Games, crossing the line as the first place male finisher in sixth place. In addition, Miles picked up a silver medal at the 2002 Manchester Commonwealth Games Triathlon, eight World Cup triathlon wins, one World Series win in 1996, and two ITU World Championship bronze medals in 1998 and 1999. Of course, Miles became the world champion in the 1991 World Triathlon Championships held on the Gold Coast at just 20 years of age. And quite incredibly, as you'll hear Miles outline, he was a member of the Australian elite team for the World Championships across 16 consecutive years. And during today's episode, you'll hear Miles touch on the highs, the lows, and the many learnings from his 20-year career as a professional triathlete. You'll hear Miles mention that he never raced in the juniors. Instead, he was straight to the professional ranks. Miles shares around the emotions of the Sydney Olympic 2000 debut and the reasons why he was only notified that he'd be racing 72 hours prior to the Olympic Games. Miles shares around what drove him as an athlete to achieve such great success keys in staying injury free and Miles shares some thoughts around the art and science of coaching. So get ready for some fantastic learnings with Miles Stewart, OAM 1991 World Triathlon Champion and CEO of Triathlon Australia. Miles Stewart as a junior triathlete in the 90s, uh, catching up with you today for this recording is is a bit of a thrill. So guys like yourself and your contemporaries at the time, Brad Bevan, Greg Welsh, you really were the face of triathlon in Australia back uh, through that era. So welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Yeah, thank you very much. Good to be here. Miles, it's been a big year, obviously, on many fronts, but uh, it was that nice honorary uh, token in June this year where uh, you were on the Queen's birthday on a roll and uh, picked up an OAM for services, triathlon and sports administration. So I think that's very fitting given it's been, what, 
how many years in the sport now? Oh, getting on to about 35 years now. So it, it's been a bit of a, uh, a long journey, a labour of love. And um, I think that's official recognition that I'm getting old, getting an award like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, you, uh, you're looking well. And uh, you've just been riding your mountain bike too, you told me, as we started. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually um, I'm half considering. I haven't raced since I retired. So I stopped racing in 2004 and I've never done a competition since. So I'm half considering the swim bike ride at the National Cross Tri Champs in, in February. 20th of Feb down there at um, Threadbow so I'm thinking about um, or cracking back actually 1500 metre swim 30k mountain bike so I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bit keen to give it a go well mate we, we heard it first here this could be the comeback of Miles Stewart and it was 2004 your final season uh, of yeah. racing and that was what was quite startling to me you'd had 16 consecutive years of uh, elite Australian uh, triathlon Australia representation at the World Championships. Yeah, well, that was my 20th year in the sport, but yeah, I'd, I'd been selected in the Australian team for the World Championships 16 years back to back, which, you know, at the time didn't feel like a big deal, but certainly since I've stopped and I've seen how hard it is to be injury free, sickness free, up the front with a, you know, with an Australian team that was very stacked with good athletes, it's a long journey, and I'm um, pretty proud of that today, actually. I mean, 16 years of consecutive anything is, a, is, is hard, but let alone when it's cutthroat, because it's not like triathlon in Australia at the elite level was dwindling in the ranks. It no. was one of the powerhouses. Yeah, you know, when we tried to qualify for world champs, sorry, for Olympic Games in Sydney in 2000, there was six males and six females ranked top 20 in the world, or top 12 in the world at the time, and uh, there was about eight world champions going for six positions, so it was an incredibly tough environment, and... Um, you know, of course, you mentioned Brad and Greg earlier, and my dream was to go to Olympic Games with them as the, as the older people in the sport who'd set a lot of those platforms and foundations for people to go overseas and, and for that race to even go ahead. And, you know, my dream was to go to the Games with them, but as, as history shows, it didn't quite work out that way. Yeah, I mean, Sydney Olympics, uh, you were the first Australian male across the line, sixth place. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it was a... I was a junior at the time, and looking from the sidelines, it was a, a heck of a selection process. As you said, there could have been any number of selections, you know, made. Uh, I believe from memory, you you were sick through the trial period, which must have been quite stressful, I guess, in terms of your selection prospects. Yeah, I was. I had glandular fever, so that didn't play very. Sorry, I didn't have glandular fever. I had um, I had tonsillitis through that, which which didn't really help me um, perform well on those trials. Um, there was discretionary selection available. In saying that, I, I was in the last two years previously, so 1998 and 99, I'd medalled at World Championships both years, where no other Australian was top 10. And, um, you know, I'd won the national series, that the national championships that year with a sprint finish with Macca up in um, Malula Bar. And I was racing pretty well, so I was fairly confident that I would get the discretionary spot, but a lot of other people were as well. And um, there was a lot of great athletes on the sideline who would have qualified for any other country in the world. So, yeah, it was challenging. It was ugly. It was the first Olympic Games. Everyone wanted to be there. It meant, it meant so much to everybody. Um, I was chosen, so I was trying to protect my position. Other people were trying to take that position. Um, and, and the interesting, not a fun fact, but a really terrible fact was we didn't know that we were racing the Games until just under 72 hours before the race. As in we being yourself and the, your team, as in Miles Stewart's team? As in the Australian. Oh, well, the Australian. And so, no, it was, it was the spots. Loretta Harab's position was being challenged and whatever outcome that had would have affected mine. So if they'd managed to overturn Loretta's selection, then mine would have probably been up the same position as well. So um, it was fought out in Kaz until the 11th hour. And, you know, Loretta didn't know she was racing that race until, what, 48 hours out from her race and 72 hours out from my race. So, I mean, that's that sort of stress and uncertainty is not something that you would put it into a good performance. <laughs> it wasn't ideal preparation for either of us, but, you know, we were there to make the most of it and not have any excuses. And, um, you know, I, I laid it all out on the line the day of what I had and I didn't have enough on that day. Um, it was fun. It was the best race I've ever done. It was the most exciting um, experience and dynamic to be involved in. There was 300,000 people in Sydney just screaming at you during an event and... Uh, it was such a cool feeling. It was a great couple of weeks. I had the time of my life. And, um, you know, it's an experience that I'll... I don't think I'll ever experience anything as wonderful as that ever again. Just that whole couple of weeks of magic that happened down there through that through those games. But, you know, a lot of people's race experience is what hinders or, or affects them after the games, whether they had a great time or a bad time, solely on their 
race performance. And so for me, it was wonderful. I didn't have the best race, but I had a great time. Other people who had a bad race just hated it. Yeah. So very different experiences for different people. Yeah. And I mean, that it's a great photo in Jane Hunt's uh, book, uh, The Triathlon Chronicle, there, of you on the start line or in the transition area with your, your uh, uh, cap on getting ready for the swim. And I just look at the photo and think, I wonder what's going through your mind. <laughs> the debut of triathlon in the Olympics. After such a dogfight 72 hours earlier, you told your race in. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. I, I, um, you stood behind the opera house when they called out the countries and the names of the people coming through. And of course you'd run around the opera house down to the swim start and the crowd would cheer. Um, of course, being an S Stewart, I was the last one called out and it was in alphabetical order. And, um, they called out, uh, no, sorry, it wasn't. It was the second one called out. There was Robbo, me, and Waldo. So um, Robbo goes out, the crowd goes wild. Um, they called me out. You ran around in front of the opera house, and it was just incredible. Like, the whole um, Mrs. Macquarie's cheer, the whole way around the course, just lit up with when the Aussies were named, and it was really emotional. Like, I was running down the swim start, like, half crying, half super excited <laughs> about about it. So, yeah, it's, it, it's sort of feelings I'd never had in any other race before. Probably never had it ever after either, but um, yeah, running through in your home crowd with everybody just screaming for the Aussies was such a cool experience, you know. And what was, a way to make your Olympic debut and make, yeah. for triathlon to make its debut. Miles, well, I'm a Sydney boy too, right? So it was it, it was home ground for me. Of course, I uh, I forgot that, but yeah, you moved to the Gold Coast uh, when you were a young mm. young guy, and at that point. If my research is correct, you were speed skating, but not yet into cycling and then triathlon. Yeah, so I started off swimming initially. Um, funny story, I started swimming, you know, I used to swim with Terry Gathercole's squad down in Sydney, and of course, Ben Gathercole and I worked together recently, his son, so, you know, history has a funny way of coming back. And um, started there, I, I moved into skating when my father bought a skating rink down in Sydney, and, you know, my, my brother and my sister and I were all national champions in speed skating. And then I switched to cycling and then off into triathlon, so, yeah. And you first... I mean, triath- so you going into triathlon, this is in the 80s? Uh, uh, my first race was 85. The first race I watched was, uh, funny enough, I was with Crofty on the weekend. I was watching Nick Crofty in 1984 at, at uh, Noosa Triathlon. Mm. So a guy called Andrew Steele was training with my father for his bike leg uh, for a triathlon because it wasn't very strong. And uh, so I went up to Noosa to watch this race and I watched Crofty and Mike Irwin go off the front and do their thing. And, and, uh, and the next year I was into racing some triathlons. So those guys were a part of your, uh, I guess, inspiration uh, to, to pick it up? Yeah, well, they were. Certainly Andrew Steele was. He was national champion at the time. And, um, you know, Clayton Stevenson, another great cyclist, he was also national champion for triathlon just before that. So yeah, they were early days, early, early days. And, um, you know, I was very fortunate. My school teacher, my art teacher was Barry Voverden, who was the race promoter for all the events. And I was running cross country at school. I was obviously racing bikes at the time, which he knew about, and I'd swam when I was a kid. So he said to me, why don't I come down and give a race a go? And I, and I did, and, um, yeah, kept going from there. Gosh, and I, I mean, I commented when I, I, I met with you today here, Miles, like as a junior, it was yourself, as I said at the start, and these guys that, you know, paved the way for, the, I guess, the kids in the 90s, but they're really, was, you know, and you were household names. It was televised. You yeah. were, You know, it was... Australian sport that we're all proud of um, but for you as a junior there wasn't really that it was like as you said catching these guys at Noosa and really you guys pioneered that yeah well, oddly enough I never raced as a junior ever um, I, I raced professional from day one um, no there wasn't but there was events coming off and, and you know there was, there was American magazine and you're reading about all these guys in America and they were superstars and you know, we were young people from Australia. We were we were giving it a go. We used to race together. We thought we were going okay. No one ever knew. And then in 1988, Stephen Foster went across to America and raced the Chicago USTS race, which was one of the biggest races in the world, and he won. And we all kind of looked at each other and went, well, we know who Steve is. We race him all the time. We know we can be competitive with him. <laughs> so in 1989, we all went over to America. There was Crofty, Brad, um, Welshy, myself, and we just started racing in the States and started winning all these events. And we were like, wow, okay, all these guys that we were sort of reading about and thought they were 10 foot tall. And, you know, we were, we were super competitive from, a, from the early days. And that was the first official world champs in, in 1989. We went to Avignon in France. And, uh, and I managed to get fourth place there. I was only 18 years of age. It was a super hard day. It was 
40 degrees. There was one drink station on the run. It was a it was a crazy race. But um, I had the worst swim of my life. I was like three minutes behind out of the water from Crofty and some of the boys and Brad. And um, I managed to catch them all on the bike because I was still racing, cycling at the time, and my bike was a strength. And um, I caught them all on the bike and passed them at about 25k and, and, and gapped them all and um, held on for fourth place in the run. But I was practically dying the whole run. <laughs> and I just remember coming forth and sitting there and just going, oh, this is terrible. Like, all these guys are getting medals and I'm getting nothing. <laughs> Um, except for prize money um, they came up to me after the race and they said oh you know we don't know what to do I'm like okay what do you mean they said well you've won the juniors by 12 minutes so <laughs> we can say that you're junior world champion or we can say that you're fourth overall and you get six and a half thousand dollars US in prize money <laughs> I went I'll take fourth thank you very much and um, so I never got classed as a junior <laughs> Oh, that's fascinating fact so uh, I had the fourth place there in, uh, in 1989 and then 19. 19- 91. I mean, any of the historians of the sport know the magic that happened that year. I'm on the Gold Coast here at the Broadwater. Miles Stewart, 20 years of age, takes it out, world champion. Yeah, well, it was 90, 90 before that, and um, I wasn't the team up until a week before the world champs when I got kicked off the team. And uh, I think I'm still the only elite athlete ever to get kicked off a national team for world championships, so that's another record. Um, <laughs> I, I, and, and, look, it was, a, it was an interesting situation, and, you know, there was a race there that they recommended we do as a lead-up race to show that we were fit. I was doing another race on the same weekend where I got second that weekend, and then next thing I got a letter saying, you're off the team. So that blew me away. I watched the guys go one, two, three. Um, came out in 91 with a head of steam and pretty angry. Same team manager as the year before who kicked me off. And, uh, you know, I wanted to show people that, um, you know, I should have been there in 1990. So, um, you know, congrats to the blokes who got one, two, three, but it was, geez, it was tough to watch. And um, and then so I came out in 91 with a bit of a fire in the belly and a bit of a point to prove. <laughs> as a 20-year-old, and I mean, you know, that's, yeah, it was game one. Yeah, still pretty young now I look at it um, when I look at what's happening today. But um, as yeah. a 20-year-old with a bit of head of steam, I was um, I had a good day. Look, swim went well, bike went fantastic. And actually the run didn't go very well at all. I should have ran away. But, um, Left you know, it to the sprint finish. Yeah, I had look, I had a 100% record with sprint finishes. So um, <laughs> I was probably thought when it got to the end of the race, it was probably more important for someone to get rid of me than for me to get rid of them. And, um, you know, I didn't have any concerns. The night before the race, I was staying with a guy called Shane Johnson, a guy called Chuck Meadows, Jason Meadows, and um, we're all sort of talking about the race and having a laugh. And, and Shane goes, all right, you're 1K from the finish and you're running neck and neck with someone who wins the race. I'm like, that's easy. I'll win the race. <laughs> Shane's in the race. He punches. He had to pull out. Didn't take a spare. You, you're out non-drafting. Um, 1K to go, I'm running with the three guys in the front and Shane yells out on the side of the road, remember what you told me last night. So I put my arms in the air and I'm doing these ones one kilometre from the finish <laughs> and uh, luckily I won, otherwise I would have looked like an idiot. Yeah. So there was, a, there was a plan of a, a plan going down there and, and I mean as a 20-year-old, how did life change for you after that? As yeah. a world champion, a 20-year-old world champion. Oh, nightclubs were more fun, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I... Yeah, look, I probably didn't realise at the time, you know, the magnitude of the accomplishment. I was, I was pretty young, and I, I think as a young athlete, you're, you're sort of always looking at what's next or where to next, and you sort of tick it off and go, yeah, done that. It was almost like I always thought that I would get it. So it was interesting to um, to go through that dynamic, to to win that race. It, it, you know, it was 20 years of my life, which seemed like a lot at the time, and obviously now it's not, but... Um, it's everything I'd ever wanted to do is be world champion. And, um, you know, to get it very early was quite quite challenging then to get back up again and, 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 and compete moving after that. So it took a little while to calm down and get back into the game, I think. Because at that point, there wasn't an Olympic Games option. <sighs> Mate, there wasn't Olympic Games. So, an Olympic, so from the sports that I did in, in um, swimming and then cycling and then and speed skating, you know, outside of swimming, the Olympic Games wasn't a big deal. And in triathlon, it wasn't part of the um part of the equation so i never thought the olympics would be anything that i do and i didn't probably have the same affinity with the olympics as maybe people who come from running or some of those other other more traditional sports so um i don't think i ever realized the magnitude of the games until way after the event you know now i certainly do but um at the time i didn't even realize how big a deal that was Wow. And as you say, because speed skating, you know, I mean, obviously Winter Olympics, uh, if that's the right speed no, skating. No, I, oh, I was on roller skates. Oh, roller but skates yeah, they don't have Olympics. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, cycling, it's it's an event, obviously, and everyone wants to go, but there's... Tour de France was yeah. probably the big thing at the time. Olympics have become a lot more important in cycling lately, but at that time, Tour de France was still the was still the number one, and triathlon, it wasn't, wasn't an opportunity. And with your cycling, you were so strong and so technically, you know, well-versed on a bike. Did you ever look at that as a viable career option as a junior? Oh, yeah. I, I raced Moving track and athlete. road there for many years, and, and even when I first started... Um, cycle, triathlon, I'm still racing bikes and um, I still hold a national record on the track for a pursuit that we did a long time ago, which is interesting um, so I, I had some good pedigree there but, you know, I I went to triathlon, it was successful I went down that path but, you know, there's a part of me with these sliding doors who wonders what it would have been like if I had just kept riding a bike, for mm. sure As in, uh, you have reflected how would have it looked uh, if, if, you know, you went on to ride the Grand Tours and... Uh, yeah. Well, I look at my body shape and I think it wasn't designed for triathlon, you know, like I'm short, I'm heavy, I've got big legs, big ass, like none of that stuff's conducive to being a great triathlete if you look at the ideal body shape. So I was probably the most unlikely triathlete as far as body type at the world level. Um, So there was a whole lot of factors working against me there to be successful, whereas for cycling, I think with that big engine, big legs, big ass and, and skinny upper body, that could have been quite quite good. So I look body type, I go, mm, was I the best for triathlon or would I have been better being a bit of a tall, skinny, running type of person? Mm. Well, it's just interesting that despite your success, you know, you still have slight indoor moment reflections in life. Well, my best sport was skating. Wow. Like if I was to pick a sport that I think I was actually best at, it would have been speed skating. And not that there's anything in that, but... Um, that's the sport I think I could have won more world championships in if I had have continued down that path, for sure. All the guys I trained and grew up racing with all went on to win world titles. Miles, uh, we always ask, we theme this show the highs, lows and learnings. We definitely want to get onto the learnings because I know there's so much to extract from you around performance. But, you know, touched on the highlight of the Olympic Games, obviously the 1991 World Championship, 16 consecutive Australian um, team selections. What was a low light in your racing career, if you, if you had a... I think we touched on one of them. Obviously, being kicked off the world's team was very hard to swallow at a young age, and, and that certainly made me a little bit weary of administration and sports administration. Oddly enough, I'm back doing that as a job. But um, it, it certainly left a really bad taste in my mouth. Um, so that probably 1990 was one. If I look back, not a low light, but I think I... Because triathlon... Because the Olympics within triathlon came around so late in my career, it took a very long time for that to be a dream or, or an opportunity. And I never went to an Ironman because I knew that if I had started to go there, I wouldn't have been able to get the speed I needed to be able to go to the Games. So I really wanted to go to the Games. And then two years later, it was the first Commonwealth Games. I thought, oh, geez, I'd really like to do the first one, proper one of those too. Um, so that probably stopped me from going into some longer course racing which i think i also could have done fairly well at so um, i run a lot of half ironmans and a lot of those types of events so i think with olympics was a really good thing but then it also stopped me doing something like hawaii which i would have loved to have done yeah interesting i mean 180 k's with your legs you would have uh it would have you know been an interesting bike split i imagine yeah yeah, well well, mate anything triathlon i could do okay so it was just a matter of conditioning and you know it was just working out a puzzle to do it a bit slower and a bit longer and i don't think i would have had too many issues doing that so and then, you know, the uh, Manchester Commonwealth Games, three seconds behind Simon Whitfield in that, uh, yeah. you, you roll your eyes. Was that a, oh. was that a, was that frustration on your performance? Um, no, it's pro- pr- probably frustration on my effort. Um, in frustration Sydney, on your effort? Yeah. So in Sydney, I crossed the line in sixth place, but I was, I was dead. Like, I'd given it everything I had on the day, and I crossed the line, and I knew there was nothing more that I could have possibly done on that day. So, you know, you kind of walk away from those races, and you go, would have liked a better result, but... That was all I had on the day, and that's all you can do. Um, I crossed the finish line at Manchester. I hadn't been running for a while. I'd been injured. I wasn't sure where I was at with my run. I'd done a race two weeks before that in America. I got destroyed on the run. Um, I got in the Commonwealth Games. You know, the first 3K, Robbo puts like 30 seconds into me. I'm going, wow, I'm I'm like nailed to the floor here. Um, Four, 5K, 6K, we start to get back in the race. I'm running with Hamish Carter. We catch up to Simon Lessing, one of the legends of the sport. You know, Simon gets dropped. Whitfield's always off the front, so we'd sort of put him out of our mind. And Hamish and I are running next to each other. It's like, we're in the medals. And it, and, it, and it almost it stopped me from actually racing because I wasn't confident of where my run was at. Um, I wanted to secure a medal. Um, I held back far too much with Hamish, and I never went for Simon up the front. So I crossed the line. I could hardly blow out a candle, and I went, that was ridiculous. I, the first thing I said to my wife was, I just completely blew that race. Wow. 
because I just didn't give everything I had. And, and a race like that deserves 100% effort, and I didn't give it to 100%. So, you know, in saying that, I don't think, you know, no one knows that the result would change. It doesn't matter. That's not what I'm worried about. I, I would have just rather have crossed the finish line dead, and I didn't. So, And after that, 2002, I mean, you announced retirement in 2004, but I, I presume there was never a race that you didn't empty the tank on again, or was there more? Uh, there probably was. No, most of the time I was pretty good at it. Um, <laughs> I think it was probably more confidence. And then all of a sudden you had that medal in your pocket, and you were like, wow, do I go for the whole lot? And I was normally a victory or death athlete. It was probably one of the times in my life where I wasn't, and I, and I, and I still regret that today as far as, a, not the result, but the performance. Yeah, so so fascinating. And, uh, I mean, obviously Simon went on to... You know, he did okay. ...do some, uh, <laughs> some great things in the sport. Um, Miles, the era of televised racing in Australia, the short course, super, super sprint, tra- two is blue, yeah. uh, Accenture, and then in the middle there was... Uh, Oh, help me, Miles. Uh, Xerox try to. Xerox, yes. Yeah. I mean, obviously, they must have been some fun days. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, it was a travelling uh, traveling circus of sorts, I guess. Oh, mate, they were great. Um, and, you know, the Formula One was just a really good series. You know, tough, tough racing. Some of the hardest racing I've ever done in my life. Um, you know, I liken it being shot out of a cannon. You just you were starting off that beach and you were, you were literally dying from every second afterwards. <laughs> um, and, you know, you'd go on that series, you'd have a month off at the end of the year. You'd start, the first thing you'd do is one of these events and, man, they used to hurt. And, you know, some people would stay home and train and come out super fit and, you, and you're at a whole nother level. And, man, I remember doing Manly one year. It was, a, it was an enduro race, so swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run. I went through the first round. I didn't have a great swim. Caught up to Courtney and Levi Maxwell, another guy at the front. We're off the front. Ran the first run. I'm running going, I don't know if I can do this again. <laughs> you know, I've got to dive back in the water and do it again. Uh, and you know, you're dead on the first time round. You're like, oh, no, I've got to face all this all over again. And yeah, it, They used to really hurt. Um, but I, I loved that format of racing. Um, you know, manly beach, full crowds, fun events. You know, they were sensational. And, you know, the croc was in his element in those ones. He was he was really, really tough to beat. And Welsh, he was tough to beat. And, you know, you look at a guy like Greg Welsh, he was just as competitive at Formula One as he was at Iron Man, and you know that's that's a huge thing to be able to do. And um, loved the racing, um, yeah. TV wise, people knew who you were. You know, when we jumped in with Iron Man and did that series as well, not Iron Man Triathlon, but Iron Man Surf Life Saving, that was a really fun event. Um, great after parties, and then um, the Xerox Tri Tour. You're right, it was like a travelling circus. It was it was five Olympic distance events within two weeks. And all broken up into different components, and um, you know, plus some nights out along the way. So that was that was super super fun. And I mean, the, as you say, the media coverage was it was it was there. It was it was it was mainstream. Yeah, it was, and it's a shame that's gone from the sport because I don't think the kids today um, have that same type of advantage of being you know you know getting that familiar face within Australia because you know people would watch you on a prime time on a Sunday and yeah. almost feel like they grew up with you and knew who you were. So you know, people would come up and talk and and. My wife would go, do you know that person? I'm like, no, never met him before. And and they're talking to you like a long-lost friend. (laughs) You're listening to Miles Stewart, CEO, Triathlon Australia, OAM, and 1991 World Triathlon Champion on this, a featured performer episode of The Physical Performance Show. Support for today's show comes from Endure IQ. If you're ready to step up and take control of your training and performance goals, check out Endure IQ. Whether you're an athlete or coach, Endure IQ aims to empower you with the knowledge, tools and strategies to optimise your sports performance. Founded by Dr. Dan Plews, who you may recall from Expert Edition Episode 213, Heat Training and Acclimation for the Endurance Athlete. Endure IQ brings you online courses in the practical application of low carbohydrate high fat training fundamentals and heat strategies to get you started endure iq will gift you 25 us dollars towards your first endure iq purchase simply use the coupon code brad beer at the checkout remember information is useful but knowing how to use it is powerful endure iq hitting the sweet spot of performance health and enjoyment visit endureiq.com 
Support for today's show also comes from the Physical Performance Show's brand new Learnings membership, where from just five US dollars per month, you can support the production of the show and also enjoy free access to the back catalogue and upcoming live stream events. To date, we've hosted super popular expert edition guests, Dr. Stephen Seiler and Dr. Shona Halson, across two heavily attended and in demand live stream events around polarized training and optimizing recovery. If you'd like to support the show's production, simply jump over to Patreon and become a patron. Just search Patreon, P A T R E O N, the physical performance show. Of course, if you are an endurance athlete bothered by frustrating joint, bone, or tendon related injuries, look no further than Pogo Physio's award winning online telehealth consultations, which have helped hundreds of endurance athletes interstate throughout Australia and worldwide get back to their physical best. It's simple. You can book a 45-minute online telehealth consultation over at pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured performer, Miles Stewart, OAM, CEO, Triathlon Australia and former world champion. Miles, uh, let's shift over to some uh, to some learnings. Uh, we have a performance round, but before we jump there, what would you say, with all your successes athletically and beyond, are the top three characteristics required for athletic peak performance? I know it's a tough question because yeah. it's far more than three. Um, I, I think, yeah, choosing three. For me, what 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 I was good at was suffering. So I had the ability to, to, to punish myself and, um, and put myself through a lot. I don't know if that's a great skill to have, but it certainly helped me through an endurance sport. So I had the ability. I don't think I was ever the most, um, like I say, athletically gifted person as far as body type or, or whatever it was for triathlon, but I had an ability to suffer, which made me win a lot of races. Um, I was very good at being consistent. And for me, I monitored training on a yearly basis instead of a good week, a good day or a good session. And I made sure my back-to-back-to-back consistency was there throughout. And unlike a lot of people, I used physio massage as preventative measures instead of ones to overcome injuries. Um, I tried to make sure I never broke down, which a lot of athletes probably didn't do. So that that professionalism around looking after my body was a great quality. Um, the suffering was was a great ability to have. But um, I also had a mindset that was single-minded focused and nothing got in the way and I didn't want to be good at triathlon, I had to be. So I see a lot of kids today, you know, they love the idea, it looks great, but that I really have to and, you know, when, when you see a champion, a lot of times you'll see a burning flame inside them that can't go out that has to be good. It's not an option. It's also probably really poor behaviour afterwards, but while you're at sport, it's actually really good. <laughs> so that's just an intriguing statement. You didn't want to be good at triathlon. You had to be good at triathlon. What was the driver behind having to be good? Was that your oh, self-imposed? Yeah, I'm it was me, uh, but that was everything I did. Like I, I, had to, I had to succeed, not to anyone else's expectations, but to mine. Um, I raced from a very early age, and winning became a habit, and I was successful from a young age, and for whatever reasons, but um, I, I had a burning desire inside me to be good at whatever I did, or to be the best I could be at whatever I did, and um, that never went away. And that drive, like digging a bit deeper, it just it was always with you, or, or was it more, as you just said, Miles, you, you tasted success early, like the highest, at that mm. point, you know, highest accolade of the sport, the world title. Uh, and therefore anything less than winning really wasn't cutting the mustard. Uh, yeah, I think winning is a mindset. You know, I, I never thought that I wouldn't, and I never had those stages where I had that self-doubt or could I. I, I I'd always been able to win in, in speed skating and swimming and cycling. I'd always managed to find my way to the front somehow, and uh, same with triathlon at, at a very early age, and I, I had the desire to compete against a lot of old people from a very young age, and I was very used to racing older people from a very young age. Um, you know, I look back at some of the stuff done now, now I've got my own kids, and, you know, look at the ages that I did things, and I look at their age, and I go, wow, like, some of that stuff, you know. I have a 17-year-old son, um, when I was 17, I raced a World Cup race here in Australia, 3K swim, 130K bike and a 30K run, and, you know, that seemed normal to me at the time, and now it doesn't seem so normal, you know? <laughs> 
I remember in the Grafton Triathlon in 1990 uh, as a 10-year-old wanting to do the 1K swim, 30K yeah. ride, 8K run, and, and there was a, quite a few people saying you shouldn't run 8Ks yeah. at, uh, at 10 years of age. I, I, I found a certificate at home the other day because I was shifting house um, when I was six years old for swimming a mile straight, and I, and I go, wow, <laughs> my, my kids aren't doing that at the moment. Miles, uh, before we jump in this uh, performance round, rapid-fire questions, the squad that was on the Gold Coast, mm. the Gold Coast through that 1990s period, if you like, pre-Sydney Olympics. I remember Simon Whitfield was out here training. Uh, it, it seemed like it was the centre of triathlon in the universe, in the world. Mm. And uh, I recall a Wild Water Sports uh, presentation which came along and your father as a head coach of the squad, yourself in the squad, Chris McCormack, everyone pretty much, who's who of the world. It seemed like there was 30-odd athletes mm. that were all you know, pretty much uh, incredible at the time in the squad. Uh, that must have been quite a, a fascinating period, uh, that, that squad at the time. Yeah, look, it, it was amazing. And, you know, where does that drive come from? Where did that drive come from? I, I've got a father who was obviously heavily involved as a coach my whole career in every sport that I did. So um, that's probably part of it as well. But that squad we had on the Gold Coast was, was enormous. Um, it had multiple world champions, multiple major event winners, um, multiple Olympians. But, you know, Cole had that ability to be able to deal with everybody's ego and keep them in check and keep them going the same direction, probably because his ego was bigger than all of them. But um, <laughs> he had an amazing ability to get the best out of people, whatever that individual's person best would look like. Um, and he had amazing ability to deal with personalities and not many people have that skill set. Not many people can deal with more than one great athlete in their squad. We had heaps. So, you know, it was competitive. Um, it was challenging. Um, it, but you knew if you were in that environment that you were training and, and you would compete at world's best. Because it was pretty much what you were doing that every day. That was the standard, yeah. On, on coaching, what do you, you know, you said some of the top characteristics for an athlete, but what would you say, Miles, are the top characteristics in a successful coach? Yeah, it, it is interesting, and I think it's hard to break down. Um, I say my father had enormous ego. Um, he was, you were lucky to be in this squad. You're lucky to be here. If you don't want to like it, get out the door, and he kicked many people out. Um, he, he knew how to read people, and I think the art of coaching has been lost to the science of coaching. When I look at it today, like I don't think my father could pass a level one course, let alone a level three course, um, and, you know, with multiple world champions in different sports and multiple Olympians. So I look at that and I go, has the science gone a little bit too far as opposed to the art? And then I wonder how you actually teach people the art because the father had an amazing ability to make this person go the best that that person could be and get the, the talent out of that person. And um, I see now people trying to do very pretty programs, touch this energy system, do this, do that, the other, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I've seen programs lately where I look at them and I, I can't even decipher what they're saying. You know, and, and our philosophy on training was actually really boring. You know, it was hard, slow, and lots of it. And it's not exciting today to say that. Yeah. People are looking for more than that. But actually, you know, I talked to a famous coach the other day, and, you know, he goes, I'm still doing the Brad Bevan session and the Miles Stewart session and the, and the Simon Lessing session. He goes, I've been doing it for the last 30 years, and I've coached <laughs> Olympic gold medals because nothing's changed. But try and tell that to people today, and they're bored because they want to see something a little more flashy than that. But the coaching to me hasn't really changed a lot. We just put a lot more names on what things are, and made it sounds sexy. So the uh, the hard, slow, and lots of it philosophy. Well, what actually, funny are. enough, I asked Emma Snowsall the other day what her philosophy on was training. She said hard, slow, lots of it. I was like mine too. Fascinating, <laughs> Miles. You ready for a performance round? Some yeah, rapid fire I'll questions. See how I go. Training Have session good. most disliked. Oh, I, I really disliked doing uh, – we used to do these 1K intervals around uh, Manly Drive around here with a hill in it, and they used to kill me, so I hate them. How many are we talking? Ten. With what recovery? Oh, we were leaving on 3.30 but doing them under three minutes. With the hill? Yeah, with a hill and the heat, and it was just, yeah, ugly. Training session most loved? Uh, I used to love the long sessions in the pool, so the 10 300s, the 10 400s, those long, grinding, boring <laughs> ones, or, or super long bike rides, like, well, not super long, but 160, 180K bike rides climbing mountains. Out through the, the hinterland? Yeah, love it. Favourite pre-race meal, what fueled Miles Stewart? Oh, chicken the... nuggets for sure. Actually, and I read that, that you, yeah, you, that's did, true. you did ingest the nuggets before the 1991 world title. Well, and Greg Welsh and I, despite the fact no one knows, they probably do now, um, <laughs> We, we'd have half flat Coke and water in our drink bottles the whole time. It's like sports drinker champions. <laughs> yeah. And every uh, race. Every race. Every, whether it was every race. Formula One or Absolutely. Olympic distance or beyond. Flat Coke with water. Wow. 
Miles, uh, <laughs> you are in good company with Usain Bolt's famed chicken nugget ingestion. Uh, bedtime, morning time as an athlete, were you quite disciplined on that outside the, the parties? Amongst absolutely. The no, absolutely. Um, yeah, early to bed and early up. Tough question. Who's the athlete Miles Stewart, OAM, most admires and why? Um, yeah, that's a, probably a really hard question because there's just so many great athletes out there. But um, I I actually like, – I was really good um, – I was – did a lot of training with Mick Doolan when I was young. Um, he used to come to my father for fitness training, and I loved the motorsport. So he was an absolute legend and uh, and a friend, and uh, loved watching him compete and loved being there to watch him sometimes. Mick Doolan, Miles, was there a mantra that you'd use when you were racing, competing, like regular self talk? Oh, mate, just victory or death. Victory yeah, or death. Victory or death. And and I'd always feel like when I was in a race that the person I was next to was trying to steal my money. <laughs> so I'd look at them and go, "No, that's mine. You're not taking that." So uh, that was the other one. As in steal the money, the prize money. Yeah, correct. End. And, I mean, you picked up, I had a laugh when I read, you picked up $400 of prize money as a 15-year-old at the local mm-hmm. Rabina race. So that was pretty good prize money back Mate, then. Mate, at the time I was racing bikes and I was getting like a tube or a pizza voucher, so <laughs> $400 was quite exciting and uh, I started to do more of it. I had started the professional career. Yeah. Miles Stewart, best recovery tip? Oh, rest. I, I, I don't know, it sounds a bit silly, but... um. You know, in between sessions, I'd be home and I'd be like a zombie, to getting as much rest as possible, not being out in the sun. Um, so it, it's those little things like the, like how you recover and, and making sure that you do properly. Of course, I was a professional athlete, but a lot of people would, you know, finish training and go surfing, finish training and go out in the sun and hang out all day. That wasn't me. I was training or I was indoors and I was taking it easy. I mean, it, it speaks to that principle, that adage from Shona Halson, who features an expert here, AIS recovery science and had a director there for, for, for three Olympic game cycles and, and Shona's adage is the only training that an athlete benefits from is the training that they're recovering from. Yeah. It's easy to overlook. Well, yeah, and I, uh, and I still do it today. Like, I go hard and I rest hard. One word to describe Miles Stewart's racing style? Tough. How would Miles Stewart describe being in the zone? Um, peaceful. I, I... Sorry, you said one word. No, that was a good peaceful. <laughs> First time we've had that in two hundred and something episodes, Miles. Peaceful is in every what time stops. Just no, when you're in the zone and you're racing really well, everything's easy. So it's actually quite peaceful. It's when you're not and you're suffering that things get really, really hard. <laughs> when was the last time you're in the zone? Oh god, I can't remember. <laughs> Too old. And Miles, uh, can you remember? Uh, obviously, champions aren't built on one session alone, but yeah. you know, seasons, as you say, taking that year-on-year approach. Yeah. But what's the hardest session you can ever recall doing as an athlete? Is there one that stands out, or is it this is too many? Oh, I, I went – well, yeah, I was in Germany, and I decided I'd want to do a uh, bike ride. So I entered into a 24-hour bike ride in Germany and rode 840 kilometres, so that hurt. 840 k's in 24 hours? Yeah, <laughs> that was stupid. In Germany. <laughs> what was the elevation gain on that one? It was just round in circles. Oh, round in circles, it was, sorry. Yeah, it was tough. You're listening to Miles Stewart on this featured performer episode, sharing on his career highs, lows, and many learnings. If you missed last week's episode, episode 245, it was an expert edition featuring associate professor Shona Halson. And the episode featured some of the Q&A from the recently conducted live stream with Dr. Halson, Recovery Essentials for Optimal Performance. So there's evidence that if you sleep less, you perform poorer, and if you sleep more, you perform better. When it comes to why we perform poorer, it tends to be related to our perception of effort. What we tend to see is that, you know, your VO2 and your heart rate doesn't change after a few nights of sleeping bad. What changes is your perception of effort. Everything feels harder. Everything feels worse. Everyone knows what it's like to be horrendously sleep deprived and trying to stay awake and concentrate. Um, So that's where some of the issues lie. Now, if you missed episode 245, I highly recommend you jump back over for some fantastic learnings that will help you perform at your physical best, have a pen and paper ready and check out the live stream recording. It's still available over at pogophysio.com.au forward slash Dr. Halson live stream, along with a copy of all the PDF presentations. Join athletes, coaches, and practitioners in truly understanding the world of recovery from one of the planet's best scientific minds. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured performer, none other than triathlon legend, Miles Stewart, OAM, Triathlon Australia CEO, and 1991 World Triathlon Champion. We ask every featured performer this question. If you could boil everything you've learned through your athletic 
career mm. and successes to date, plus your ongoing career post sport, into one piece of advice to help listeners of this show, which are made up of coaches, practitioners, athletes of different levels, predominantly in the endurance world. One piece of advice to help them perform at their best. What would Miles Stewart's one piece of advice oh, be? My, my one piece of advice would be the same for any one of those people would be have the great mentors. Have the great mentors. Absolutely. Um, if you want to learn how to be a world champion, talk to one who's done it before. If you it's, want to learn to be a world champion, talk to If you want to learn how to be a great cha- coach, go and talk to the best coach you can get your hands on. If you want to be a great physio, go and find the best physio and talk to them. Because reaching out to mentors and having that guiding person is, is going to save you a lot of trial and error and heartache. But then don't just reach out and listen. You know, no point reaching out to a mentor. And, and mentorship's a two-way street. So you, you've got to give and receive. You can't just take. Mm. So, you know, reach out to people. Um, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to help. But you cut out a lot of mistakes by having the right mentors. Yeah, that's powerful advice. Miles, every guest of the show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. It can be entry level. It can be extremely difficult. It can be anything you like it to be. What's Miles Stewart? <laughs> physical challenge to the listener going to be? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I guess it depends on so many different things, but um, just to have a, a good a, a, a 20, 30K mountain bike ride out in the rain or somewhere hard is, is probably my physical challenge because, um, you know, I know how much it kills me these days. <laughs> Particularly if you come off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and on that coming off, you know, you said you, you mitigated a lot of injury through your career, mm. so you remained consistent because you took that proactive approach with therapies yeah. and rested well. Was there any, were there any injuries that really, you know, sidelined you for a period there oh yeah i cut my big toe off in a in an accident and um when i say I cut it off it was almost hanging off um i was doing some transition training and i was younger um my feet were on top of the shoes i was accelerating on the bike a lady pulled out of a driveway in a car swerved to miss her foot slipped off the front straight in between the spokes and the back of the forks and um you know the spokes went through my through my big toe and um, my dad came over and basically lifted the toe off the end and went, yep. So I had hours and hours of microsurgery to put the toe back on um, and it took me six months before I could walk again. So that was a bit of a touch and go because they thought there for a while that the toe would have to come off, um, need that to run. Um, <laughs> so that could have been a game changer for me, so I can get what it would um, <laughs> How old were you at that point? Oh, I think I was around 17 at the time, so I was only quite young, but uh, I missed six months of school and six months of walking and, um, you know, getting that thing back to working properly, I don't think it ever really has, but... Wow. Yeah. I mean, biomechanically, it is such the powerhouse. <laughs> it's 50% of the running gates from below the knee and that big toe is one of the, is the yeah. key component, really. Yeah, it's quite essential. So I'm lucky, it, lucky um, I met the right surgeon on the right day and, and, and it worked out okay. Miles Stewart, post-sport, you've you obviously moved into your post-sporting career and mm. the, your current role is CEO of Triathlon Australia, which I believe you've been in the role for... Two, almost two five years. years now, oh, sorry, Mum. So yeah, missed that. Yeah, five, five years. Five years. Um, Pre Rio Olympics. Yeah, started. I just started just before Rio, like literally about six months out before Rio, I got the job, and um, you know, that was interesting because everything had already been put in place, and there was not much room to change anything at that late period. But um, it was good. It was great to be there. Great to see it all unfold. We won our first Paralympic gold medal, of course, in Rio, which was exciting and. Great to see MJ back helping out Katie Kelly and, and that being successful. Um, KK is an amazing athlete. Um, so, yeah, I've been here five years, but I went into funds management business after after sport and I did that for around 15 years. Um, I was head of leasing at a company called Charter Hall. We owned shopping centres all over Australia and, and I ran all the income. So acquired shopping centres, developed shopping centres and, and did all leasing for shopping centres. So my background's in funds management now. I was in sport, I guess, but... Um, you know, then the, the opportunity came back to get involved in sport, and uh, and I took that opportunity, and I've been been happy ever since. And I mean, Triathlon Australia. I read in preparing for today uh, a conversation you had with Shane Smith around uh, part of the hard judgment of uh, a sport like triathlon in Australia is if the elite pool isn't doing well, <laughs> the, the general consensus is that the sport mustn't be yeah. doing well in Australia. Yeah, it does get like that. People love those high performance results. Um, to be fair, the core of my job is participation and membership and not necessarily HP. Um, but I think, and I said that based off the fact of who I was, and I think we had a pretty bad run. The Olympics, uh, Rio was the first time we hadn't medaled in the able body um, divisions, and we didn't medal in the Commonwealth Games. We got a third in the mixed team relay. Um, that was the first, only medal we got. We didn't get any individual medals. And so part of my role was to turn that around and start pointing it back in the right direction. And 
you know, the Commonwealth Games were quite successful for us on the Gold Coast. Um, you know, Tokyo, who knows? We're not there yet. We should have been. Um, <laughs> we'll find out maybe next year how that goes. But um, I do feel like as a program, it's, it's, it's more robust. And I feel like it's heading in the right direction. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the results. We've been getting like some world championships and some stuff which hadn't been there for a while. And Miles, to the participation level of the sport, uh, if there's someone listening in who maybe is distance runner who's entertaining a triathlon, mm. what would be your advice to the person on the sideline who, you know, we've been there in some fashion, anyone, where you can feel a little bit overwhelmed with the prospect or it all looks like everyone's got the bikes and you've got the old roadie in the yeah. garage. What's your advice, uh, Miles Stewart, well, CEO of uh, Triathlon Australia, to the person considering the first, well, first I, race? I think my first piece of advice would try and lo- hook up with a local club because it can take a lot of the mystery out and get some a lot of good tips and trips of tips tips and tricks off people who are actually doing that all the time. So um, definitely reach out to a local club because it, it probably takes a lot of that fear. But um, one of the things we put in place last year was the indoor triathlon, and, and we put that in place to get rid of some of the big fears we know about triathlon. And, and one of those big fears is swinging the open water. Mm. Another one of the fears is riding on an open road, and and, and the third one is is, is cost. So cost of a bike in these days and how much people spend on that stuff. So we started an indoor program to get people on board to take a lot of that mystery out and a lot of that fear out. And when you tried a nice, safe venue, it was to give people the confidence and to go out and get onto the road and give it a proper crack on, on the outdoors. But um, So getting involved in that indoor program is a nice, soft way into the sport without the need to buy a bike, without the need of fear of swimming in the open water or worry about riding on the road initially until that confidence gets up. And, and has an indoor sporting events you know taking the turn for the more popular amongst the you know mandated corona period with things like Zwift racing and super league arena games and you know you name it yeah absolutely and and it was always probably going to but i think covid gave it a massive kickstart <laughs> and a massive boost in, in in that direction so uh i've certainly been a keen observer of some of the things going on uh we host our own Zwift rides you know, I'm, I'm one of the things I'm really trying to get going is a national duathlon championships so where we're going to have people race anywhere and race each other. So that's something I'm looking forward to doing because I think that then opens us up to anybody in a Sydney CBD apartment or anybody out in the bush who's got a, a home trainer and a pod for their running shoe or, or, or a treadmill at home who can compete. Yeah, opens the, uh, opens the geography right up and uh, eliminates the travel. Yeah, absolutely. we just got to find out how to stop people cheating. <laughs> well, I actually read though, Miles. There was, I think, the first sanctioned uh, ban on a couple of Zwift uh, cyclists who uh, <laughs> were, were caught uh, manipulating the data. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know why, but yeah, people do. Miles Stewart, thanks for stopping by and your contribution to the Physical Performance Show. No worries. Thank you. So there you have it, another episode of The Physical Performance Show. And I trust you enjoyed Miles' sharings today. If you did, then please jump over to social, share a podsy. That's an episode you're enjoying, tagging in The Physical Performance Show at Physical Performance Show. Then, of course, follow along on the Facebook page. And we're also now on YouTube, where the shows are syndicated each and every week. And a big shout out to Miles, who has just been elected as a director to the board of World Triathlon, meaning that for the next four years, Miles will help guide the direction of the great sport of triathlon. So congratulations, Miles. Now, as you heard earlier in the show, we have launched the Physical Performance Show's Learnings Membership, where from just five US dollars per month, you can support the production of the show. And as a way of saying thank you, we'll give you access to all of the back catalogue and upcoming live stream events. And I just wanted to do a personal shout out to our patrons that exist at the moment, Lynette Fraser, Peter Lloyd, Alexandra Offray, and Jen Morose. A massive thanks, guys, for your support of the show. And the membership's genesis is real simple. Over the years, we've had quite a few people ask if there's any way they can practically support the show. And Patreon is such a fantastic and easily accessible way to do that. So if you'd like to become a patron of the show, simply jump over to Patreon and search The Physical Performance Show. Now, a massive thanks to today's show sponsor, Endure IQ. Dr. Dan Plews, founder of Endure IQ, 
knows his stuff. He's the world age group record holder for the World Ironman Triathlon Championships in Kona, which he set in a blistering 824 in 2018. Endure IQ's online courses are absolutely full of learnings if you are seeking your best long course or triathlon performance, or indeed any endurance sporting goal. Be sure to take advantage of the coupon code BRADBEER to receive $25 US off your first Endure IQ online course. And as always, a massive thanks to the great folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin, all things show administration, and Matthew Alding, all things show graphic design. Now, coming up on the Physical Performance Show, we will be catching up with Rachel Nalen, Australian Olympic cyclist. And Rachel was making her way back from Europe, then into hotel quarantine, hence why you are yet to hear Rachel featured on the show. But hang tight for that one. Plenty of great highs, lows and learnings. We'll also be featuring Jessica Hull, three times Australian national record holder across the 1500 metres. And then we'll be featuring an expert edition with Dr. Dan Robinson on all things to do with your nose. That's right, your nose. Can you breathe in through your nose? If you can't, you may have an obstruction. How do you know? What do you do about it? And how's that affecting potentially your health and performance? I've just had functional rhinoplasty in the last several months, and it's already made a big difference in my day-to-day activities. So I thought it's high time we touched on this subject around breathing through your nose. So stay tuned for Dr. Dan Robinson. And of course, we'll be bringing you at the close of the year, the best of expert editions and the best of featured performers. Some of the key moments and learnings from the 2020 calendar year. In the meantime, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.